Hey, thanks for tuning in to a brand new episode of Extreme Reloading. You know, if you've been watching our past episodes this season or even previous seasons of Extreme Reloading, or you know, you've probably had the same experience yourself. And what I'm referring to is that occasional flyer. You know, we've done our absolute utmost best to load a batch of ammo, made it as absolutely consistent as possible, made measurements, and the stuff looks to be absolutely consistent. We've done our job on the trigger. Everything felt just right. Sight alignment, trigger squeeze, and still we get that flyer. Well, I've been doing some research into that, and one of the notions out there is that, especially as we tend to use today, more of the harsh chemical ultrasonic cleaners, the idea is that there is a coating um, or there is an effect um, on the inside of this case mouth because of that ultrasonic cleaner. Um, and, and I guess the idea is that some of these cases will have a very, very clean inside of the case mouth. Some others may have a little bit of residue. Some may have um, variability in those inside, interior of the case mounts. Then the idea is, the theory goes, that as we seat that bullet um, and as that round is fired, the bullet is ejected from the case in a non-uniform fashion relative to some of the other rounds in the same string that we're firing. That makes sense. It could be the case. And so what I'm going to be doing is a little experiment. I have 20 brass cases prepared here, ready to go. This is federal champion brass that I have annealed. And all of this brass is extremely consistently prepared. Every one of these cases is between 175.6 and 176.0 grains in weight. In other words, they vary by only four-tenths of a grain in weight. So extremely consistently prepared. The lengths, primer pockets, you guessed it, everything extremely consistently prepared. I'll be loading these with my RL15 powder, exactly as I always do. Uh, bench rest primers or match primers are going to be used. And then I'll be topping them all off with these 168, well, 168.2 grain Sierra tipped match king bullets. You know, I've been firing these a long time and occasionally, a little bit too frequently, sometimes I get those flyers. Now, of these 20 cases, what I'm going to be doing is five of those cases will be loaded absolutely the normal way I'm doing it. In other words, after I put the powder in, the bullet gets pushed in. Nothing special is going to be done to the inside of those case mouths. The next five cases, um, before I put the powder in and all that, they're going to be vigorously cleaned with this RCBS case mouth brush, nylon brush. The other ten are going to be prepared a little bit different, a little bit special. What I've done is I've purchased this Forster case graphiter. It's actually produced by Bonanza Reloading Equipment. I got this from Midway USA, mounted it on a little bit of cedar here. The idea is that we use this motor mica powder right here, came with the kit. Pour that in the well, close it up, shake it up vigorously, let things settle nicely. And then what we're going to have is these nylon bristles are going to be coated with that motor mica. Now the motor mica is not supposed to have any effect whatsoever on the powder and the firing. So uh, that kind of goes out of the picture. There's plenty of evidence that there's no effect that way. So that's a good thing to know. Then I'm going to take 10 of these cases and I'm going to be um, uh, running them on these nylon brushes that have been coated a little bit by that motor mica. And it's supposed to smooth out the inside of those case necks. 
making for a much smoother insertion of the bullets and more importantly it's supposed to in theory allow the bullet to eject in a much more uniform fashion now I'll be firing all 20 of these rounds four different five shot groups at 200 yards when I head out to the range and I'm hoping that we'll get an inkling some sort of idea of does this whole process make um, or allow us to have more precise groups, smaller groups or at least more consistent groups. So I'm excited to see how all this goes. Another uh, one of our fact or fiction types of questions we're going to try to answer. So stick around, we'll be heading out to the range in just a little bit. Alright, so this first group belongs to the mica mouth group, upper left bullseye. And when I measured CBTO on these, they were, you know, pretty consistent, but not as consistent as the last group that I'm going to fire. Twenty six hundred. Huh. How's it going? Like it's in about an inch of the other one, 2616. You know, it's actually kind of a warm day here. Pretty much October, very, very end of September, but it's like 80 degrees. That one looks like it flew high. Now it looks like it's high and off to the left about 11 o'clock. Hmm. Huh. Well, not the greatest of groups, I would say. I'm calling this one my standard load. Nothing special at all done to the case mounts prior to pushing in the bullet. Last one. Back on safe. Bullseye in the lower left. I'm calling this the scrubbed case mouth. Scrubbed case mouth. Here we go. Twenty six fifteen again. Ah, okay, that one flew up about ten o'clock.
Last group. Bullseye in the lower right. This is also a mica mouthed case. And it also, these five rounds have the exact same cartridge base to ogive measurements. We'll see if that makes a difference today. Of course, the others varied by only a thousandth or two, so not much different than any of these. Six fifteen. Getting a lot of them at about that same velocity. Flew way to the left. But not because of me. Trigger squeeze, sight picture look just fine. Climbing in velocity a little bit. Last round. Now this is really interesting. You know, there is a lot going on and a lot to talk about. Let's begin by looking at the target, the target itself. And, uh, you know, if I had only shot one group with the mica mouth uh, adjustment or the mica mouth treatment, and if that group was the first group that I used, then I would conclude that using mica actually hurts uh, the, the precision or degrades the precision of my groups. If on the other hand, I used only one mica mouth group and it was the final group that I shot, well, then I would obviously conclude that using mica in the mouths uh, definitely improves my precision. But that wasn't the case, and that's exactly why I used two separate groups. Doing this allows us to answer the question of uh, does applying mica, or perhaps even graphite, or perhaps just scrubbing that case mouth clean on the inside, does that improve precision? And what that tells us is that none of those treatments, well, of course, I didn't use graphite, but the treatments that I used today, um, none of those treatments can be considered uh, to have an effect on precision. In other words, that's not the driving variable or the driver affecting the differences in precision that we saw today. And I can say that with some confidence when we look at the results and plot all these results using what's called a box and whisker chart. Now this box and whisker chart or box and whisker graph, uh, let me explain what this thing is actually showing us. You'll see on the left side that Y axis, the vertical axis, is showing us precision in measured in minutes of angle. The big reddish box in the center uh, has an X in the center of it, and that is the current mean value or average value of MOA for all the different groups that I've fired with this Ruger Precision Rifle using the Sierra Tipped Match King 168 grain Tipped Match King bullets. There are currently 63 five-shot groups that I've shot with that bullet, and the mean is about 1.1 MOA. The black bar in the lower quarter of that red box is the median value for those 63 groups, and it is, or it has, a value of 1.02 MOA. Now, you might recall that whenever we see a difference between the mean 
and the median, what that indicates to us is that there are some outliers, there are some extreme, in this case, high values in those 63 groups that is pulling the mean away from the median. Now the median, as recall, is what we consider statistically to be a resilient statistic. Median simply means the middle value. Just like when you're driving down a divided highway, the median is in the middle of your northbound versus southbound traffic, right? So the median is not a, uh, or it is a resilient statistic, uh, and it's simply telling us that of all the different groups, the middle um, MOA value um, is 1.02. 1.1 something uh, is the mean value. And that being higher and fairly different than the median tells us that something is going on. So if we look back at that box and whisker plot, the upper end and the lower end of that red box tells us that those are the bounds within which we can consider uh, the group, the resulting group, to be a normal or normally distributed group. In other words, any group that we shoot based on all 63 of these uh, groups, that's about 1.45 MOA down to about 0.85 MOA uh, is a more or less normal group. Now you might be thinking that's not that good of a um, result for that Ruger precision rifle. And what I'll say to that is, yeah, you're right if that was 100% true, but those 63 groups include a lot of my little experimental groups that didn't turn out so well, like some of the stuff that we did today at 1.8 MOA. It's part of that same statistical population. Um, and so I think really we could probably uh, compress that red box a little bit more and if I could winnow it down to show only my, um, my best loadings, right, where I wasn't experimenting with this and that, which I've been doing like crazy over the years, uh, then that box, the, the height of that box would be quite a bit smaller and probably quite a bit lower in the uh, box plot itself. Now going back again to that box and whisker plot, what we're looking at above the red box and below the red box, it sort of looks like a T and it sort of looks like an inverted T on the bottom. Those are what is called or are called whiskers. Now any group that we fire that has an MOA of greater than about 1.45 up to about 1.85, that is considered a possible outlier. And any group that we fire that has an MOA of greater than about 1.85, greater than that, or above the whisker, that's a probable outlier. And so that first group that we fired today, the first mica mouth group, is right in there of being a probable outlier. It shot worse, uh, statistically worse, than um, our average or normal uh, group. Uh, notice also we could have some possible or probable outliers below the, um, the red box, and those might also be anomalously good groups, uh, something that is pure luck. Those rounds, for whatever reason, um, just fell right next to each other, and they really don't represent the average or norm that we get by shooting that 168-grain Sierra-tipped match king in this particular Ruger Precision Rifle. So if the preparation of all these cases and the resulting groups that we saw today is not driven by how I prepared those mouths, mica, scrubbed, or standard, if it's not driven by case mouth preparation, then what is it driven by? What can explain or help explain the results we saw today? Well, there's lots of things, of course, we could be pointing to or thinking about, 
Uh, but one of those variables, drivers, that I've been monitoring for quite some time now is what's called CBTO, Cartridge Based to Ogive. And I talked about Cartridge Based to Ogive uh, when we were shooting today, and I also uh, talked about it as we were doing our large annealing experiment earlier in this season. Now you might recall earlier this season during that uh, annealing experiment uh, I ended up shooting some very very nice groups when the cartridge base to ogive measurement was a solid 2.063 all five of those rounds uh, over two different groups were exactly at that value of 2.063 and that gave us some really excellent groups down in close to half MOA size groups at 200 yards. Today again we're seeing that almost magical value of 2.063 giving us some very very nice small groups sub MOA size groups. Now we talked when I was firing I was talking about the variability in cartridge based to ogive and that variability the variability in CBTO is not the driver it's not that we have to simply reduce the variability in cartridge based to ogive measurement what we've got to do is we got to find that sweet spot what does this particular rifle like and that really relates to that jump the distance that the bullet has to move uh, as it's ejected from the mouth of the case uh, until it hits the lands or that lead area of the rifling and 2.063 has time and time and time again proven to be kind of that sweet spot or that perfect spot that this particular Ruger precision rifle likes it obviously can do okay with a little bit of variability but what we saw earlier this season is 2.063 gave us those again almost half MOA size groups so um, that is one lesson learned in our uh, shooting that we did today looking back at all these results I'd like to point out that all of these groups were fired in a total time span that were very very similar to one another um, most of those right around two and a half minutes for the five shot group and I'm trying to keep everything as consistent as possible uh, I was also giving that rifle at least a five minute cool down between groups and uh, again trying to keep things as consistent as possible so we can interpret these results with, without saying oh, gee maybe it was also this maybe it was also that and let's take a look at the muzzle velocity results very very similar here as well and they really should be very very similar cases exactly the same primer powder charges weighed exactly to a tenth of a grain and we're getting about 2600 feet per second across the board the first two groups had a standard deviation in the teens 13.3 feet per second standard deviation uh, and the last two groups had a um, very nice very nice and low standard deviation of only seven feet per second so what we're seeing here is that you know driving down those uh, standard deviations of our muzzle velocities yes it's important we don't want to see 30s and 40s out there but I think as long as we're seeing things in the teens and below we're we're golden we're in very very good shape now that standard grouping shot really really nice and it had a 13.3 13.2 uh, feet per second standard deviation so that variation there standard deviations uh, is not necessarily the driver either so fact or fiction does the use of mica on the mouths inside the mouth of a of a case improve the precision of our rifle rounds uh, right now I'd have to say no I haven't tried graphite I have some graphite powder that I could try I don't really think that's gonna make a difference looking at these results that inside the case mouth preparation just doesn't look like it is a strong driving variable 
However, I'm all ears. If you have some experience with graphite or a slightly different approach to um, eject that bullet uh, out of the uh, case mouth and make it even more consistent so I'm getting very, very nice precision on the far end, I'd like to hear about that. Go ahead and post your comments and observations in the comments section below. Next up on Extreme Reloading, we're going to be looking at case necks, case neck thickness, and we're going to be doing some stuff on case volumes. Until next time, thanks a bunch for watching.